everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, today's session will be about uh, testing and treatment of LTBI in pediatric. Um, so we have our speaker, Dr. Christina Fasia, who is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at St. Peter's Health System. She also works as a pediatric TB specialist at the Middlesex County Chess Clinic in Edison, New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fasia. Over to you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Friday morning. Um, so I'm here to continue with this TB 101 series, and I'm going to talk about pediatric LTBI. Okay, new share. Why isn't it advancing? Am I clicking on the screen or just... Um, I uh, got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so first we'll talk about why and how children are different than adults. Okay. One thing I'll say, I'm guaranteed to smile every single day when I work with children. So that's what makes my job so fun. Um, we're going to talk about who do we want to test for TB, what kind of tests we want to use, um, the diagnosis of LTBI, how it's made, what treatment options we have, how we can educate parents, and how we can ensure treatment compliance, as well as I'll talk about some a uh, few sides about window prophylaxis, and I'll also go over some cases. So firstly, a little bit of epidemiology, because this came out recently. So as everyone probably heard, the TB cases came down in, during COVID. So from 2019 to 20, 20% drop, um, and then it went up a little bit, but still it was 13% down from 2019. And in 2022, which is the latest data, it went up. By 0.4%. We know that there is about 13 million people in the United States living with LTBI. Okay. And the reason these cases went down during COVID, we think, is because of missed diagnoses, delayed diagnoses, and also changing um, migration and travel patterns. So, here, these are actually the numbers in less than four year olds. So from 2021, 160, it went up to 202 cases in 2022, which is actually a 26% increase. And anecdotally, I know for sure this number is going to go up in 2023, just based on the number of cases that we're seeing. Um, so I have a feeling in 2023, this number would definitely be higher. So it's important to know about pediatric TB. For those of you not from New Jersey, just so you know, New Jersey is uh, considered a higher incident state among the other states, usually along with Texas, California, and New York. And then within New Jersey, I'm at the Middlesex County TB Clinic, which as you can see is one of the two highest incident TB regions in or counties in New Jersey. Okay, so. I know you guys have some lectures before on LTBI, and basically diagnosing LTBI is sort of the same criteria in children as it is in adults. So you need some kind of positive TB test. You need a normal chest X-ray or just evidence of healed, so nothing active. And you need to make sure that there's no active disease. However, I just want to emphasize that children are definitely not small adults, okay? So you can't treat them as small adults. And the reason for that is one, just based on their age. So just by being less than four years of age, that is a risk factor for developing disease once you're infected, along with recent infection, so within past two years. So if you have a toddler that's two years old, you know they're gonna be infected in the last two years. And then, as you probably heard, medical conditions can also predispose to developing disease like Hodgkin's, um, renal disease, diabetes, malnutrition, and different kinds of immunosuppression as well. So just as a note, latent TB infection in a child should be considered a sentinel event for recent transmission, okay? Kids get primary TB and they get it from an adult who's infectious. So if you find a child with, who's infected, you know that they are around some adult out there that is um, coughing or having TB disease and is contagious. Okay, so if you look at the general population, we know about 10% will develop disease during their lifetime once they're infected. 
half of those people will develop the disease in the first two years after infection. However, if you look at children and you look at this table, starting with infants, 50% of them will develop disease, okay? Most of them will be pulmonary TB, but 10 to 20% will be disseminated or TB meningitis, which can be fatal. Then the toddlers, one to two-year-olds, still 10 to 20% for um, pulmonary, less for meningitis. Two to five is about 5%. And then there are these safe school years between the age of like five to 10, where luckily there's somewhat lower risk. But then once they hit puberty, especially girls, have an increased rate of TB disease as well, although they tend to have more adult-type um, disease or like pulmonary effusions but up to 10 to 20%. So this is the crux of pediatric TB, okay? These risks um, are why we jump on little kids who are exposed and who are infected because we don't want them to develop disease. This is just a great diagram from, I think it's like the 1930s um, where I wrote a, like this red line is where your TB test turns positive. But this is time from infection months. And look at how quickly miliary and meningeal TB. Look how quickly fever. Look how quickly the primary complex or bronchial um, problems can start in children. Okay? So if you have this in your mind, then that's the first step. Um, just to go through a case. So this was a few years ago. I had a nine-year-old who came to my pediatric ID clinic. Um, the pediatrician had done a 10 millimeter TST or a TST that was positive, 10 millimeters, and it was previously negative. Chest X-ray was actually abnormal, right? Hyler adenopathy. The kid was born in India, but moved to the U.S. when she was four, and she went back to India just to visit two years ago. Father said he's completely healthy, no symptoms, and when I examined her, she was completely fine. Exam was normal. So it turned out that the mother uh, was actually in the hospital, with smear positive cavitary pulmonary TB. She had had months of dry cough, failed multiple courses of antibiotics, sort of the usual um, story. And she ended up in the hospital because she was having a hard, hard time tolerating her medicines. Father had already been tested. He was 10 millimeters on the TST. His chest X-ray was pending, but he denied any kind of cough. And this whole time I'm sitting there, there's the nine-year-old, there's the father, and there's a little boy sitting next to him in the office. And he said, who's that? Oh, it's the four-year-old brother. I said, well, has he been tested? No, no. So it turned out he was tested um, two to three months ago for some other reason. So that was negative. But since this whole ordeal happened, he had not been tested. So we registered him straight away. Luckily, got a chest X-ray and that was already positive. Sorry. So that was already positive, already had Hyler adenopathy right in here. So the good news was he came to the, or we found out that there was a brother as well. Both the sister and brother were started on TB medicines and completed their six months and did absolutely beautifully. So just as a lesson, you always have to ask about siblings, ask about cousins, in other contexts, especially the little ones, okay? And if you don't ask, they may not tell you. Also ask about other family members who are living in the house. So sometimes people live in a multi-family home. Each family has a different room. So you have to ask about that, okay? So this is why we need to look for little ones. Okay, so first, who should we test for TB? And I apologize if I start coughing. I have a residual cough from <laughs> virus like two or three weeks ago. Um, so we basically want to test children who are at risk for TB. And those who are at risk for TB are the ones who are at risk for being exposed to TB. That makes sense, right? So any child who's close contact to a person with active TB disease, any child who's born in an endemic country, any um, child who traveled to an endemic country, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail. Also household contacts who might be from endemic countries, either living with the family or just visiting. Sometimes grandparents, relatives come from other countries. Also living with another person who has LTBI increases the risk. 
and um, lesser risks if somebody's been around someone in prison, shelter, nursing homes, those with you know illegal drug use or HIV, or drinking raw milk or eating unpasteurized cheese, which can lead to mycobacterium bovis disease. So the AAP does have a validated risk assessment question that we know if these question answers are positive, then there's definitely a risk. So first question, has your child been exposed to anyone with TB? They say yes. Then of course you have to figure out is it TB disease or LTBI that that person had. If it turns out that that person has TB disease and nothing's been done, Test the child and right away call the local health department, please, so that they can go out, investigate the case. It's usually the case is found first and then they look for children and contacts around them, but sometimes it's the other way around. So just to make sure that um, the local health department knows. Then next question, does your child have close contact with anyone who has a positive TB test? That they may know as well. Third question. <coughs> Sorry. Was your child born outside the United States? Okay, if the answer is yes, the next question is where? Okay, basically the entire world is endemic for TB except US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Western and Northern Europe. We can pretty safely say that the rest of the world is um, higher risk. Then the next question is, did that child travel to one of those high risk countries? And if they say yes, next question is when? When did they go? Who did they stay with? And how long did they go for? So usually it's two or more weeks, which counts as an exposure. And especially children who go to visit friends and relatives are at higher risk because they're gonna be around the local population. So if a family says, oh yeah, we went to the Caribbean for a cruise and stayed in a resort for a week or two, I don't count that as an exposure, okay? It's more, we went to visit grandparents, stayed for three weeks, things like that. That's a true exposure. Um, the New Jersey Department of Health and GTBI, along with my colleague, Dr. Kali Seth, came up with this more extensive pediatric TB risk assessment questionnaire, which goes through a lot more um, questions. And the link is posted right next to it. So once we know who to test. Um, the children who actually need immediate testing are the ones who are contacts to suspected cases, the ones who we think might have TB disease, are the children who are immigrating for countries. Now that includes children who were adopted. I can't forget about that as well, okay? And then those who had significant travel. Other people we need to test, children who actually have HIV should be tested every single year, okay? Children with underlying medical conditions that would increase their risk for a progression to disease like we talked about with malnutrition, diabetes, chronic renal failure, immunodeficiencies, technically they're only gonna get TB if they're exposed, correct? So if there's any exposure, you need to test them right away. And sort of a separate category here is if, you're about to start immunosuppressives, prolonged steroids. And by prolonged steroids, I mean more than two milligrams per kilo per um, day for two weeks or longer. Also, if you wanna convert that, it's 15 milligrams a day. Um, any kind of biologics, especially the TNF alpha antagonists, or if they're going for organ transplant, they should be tested, okay? Because you wanna test and find um, and evaluate them before they're started on immunosuppressives so you can start LTPI treatment. So that's an important point. This is just also part of the same risk assessment, sorry, um, tool that is much nicer than the slides I made. <laughs> and it just goes through both the categories. Okay, so which test to use? I heard that um, the difference between TST and IGRAS was reviewed. As you guys know, the tuberculin skin test um, needs two visits one for placement and one for reading. Um, and it measures the induration in 48 to 72 hours. So it requires two visits. It's very cheap. However, you need somebody experienced that knows not only how to place the tuberculin skin test, but also to read it correctly. Because if any of those variables don't work, 
then the test is useless, okay? The newer tests, which include um, quantifieron, a picture here, or a T-spot, these are both the interferon gamma relief assays, are very nice because it's a one-time visit. However, it is more expensive and sometimes it can cost up to $300 for a patient. So which test do you use in children? And this algorithm has been changed over the years, um, various times, and the age cutoff has basically been decreased over the years. So if you have a child who's less than two years of age, TST is the preferred um, test. There's people that say probably one to two year olds are fine, but we don't really have the data. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming day, years, the data does come out and then um, we'll say, okay, we can do this from one year on. But for now it's two years. If um, the child is more than two years old and has had a BCG, which if they're coming from other countries, again, they will have that because it's routinely given in other countries at birth. Um, then you should use an IGRA, either the quantifieron or the TST, or the, sorry, the T-spot. If they did not have a BCG, but they're older than two years of age, then um, you can use either, okay? So that's the important points there. How do you interpret positive or negative? It's similar to adults. Um, so if you're a close contact for TB, to a TB case or children with suspected TB disease, the induration only has to be five millimeters or more, okay? Or children who are immunosuppressed. So the higher risk of progression and higher risk for TB, the lower the cutoff. The change or the difference compared to adults is that children are at increased risk for disseminated disease. So just by being less than four years old, automatically your cutoff becomes 10 millimeters, okay? Uh, then that group is also included kids with other medical conditions and children or adolescents who are born in other places, travel to other places, um, or have been exposed to high-risk adult individuals. Okay, so any less than four-year-old 10 millimeter TSD is positive. And then same as in adults, greater than or equal to 15 millimeters is technically positive. Um, in any child greater than or equal to four years, even if they don't have any risk factors. Now, <clears throat> it's debatable. Probably these kids should not be tested. You should be testing the ones who have risks, right? Um, but that's the end. Which one is better, the TST or the IGRA? And there's always new data coming out. So sensitivity, which finds the positive results, um, higher rates in quantifieron and T-spots, Specificity, where you want to rule out. Um, TB is also better with the IGRAS, quantifieron and the T-spot. The IGRAS can have an indeterminate rate, especially in the little ones. So if that happens, or the equivocal and the T-spot, indeterminate and quantifieron, you just have to repeat it. And I usually take about a month before I repeat that. Okay, so... You know your TB test, whichever one it was, is positive. What is the next step? Okay. So this is part of your diagnosis of latent TB. So next, you have to get a chest X-ray on these children. And the most important part is to get a two-view chest X-ray with um, kids who are less than five. If you talk to radiologists, they like two views on everybody because it gives them more information. And the reason you need a two view is because children with active disease often are completely asymptomatic, as was the case with the four and the nine year old. And all you can see sometimes is hyalur adenopathy, which is more easily picked up on the lateral view than on the AP view. So that's why if you order a chest x ray, especially on the little ones, always get a two view. Second thing is, I always look at these x rays myself. And I always review them with the pediatric radiologist. I'll take it one step forward, review it with the pediatric radiologist who has some experience with pediatric TB, okay? Because it's not that common and some people don't have it. 
Um, but it's that's the most important. I've had many, many chest x-rays that were read as positive by adult radiologists. And when we read it with the pediatric, it's normal or vice versa. Red is normal and it's actually abnormal. So um, of note, calcifications or granulomas are considered non-active and can be treated as latent TB. The next thing is no signs or symptoms of TB disease, i.e. you need to get a very thorough history for symptoms. So especially the little ones, right? How do you get TB symptoms in, a, in an infant? Often they're not coughing. Um, but irritability, fevers, not eating. So in the infants, it's like anything that's not right is, is a red flag. In older kids, um, they can be irritable, having headaches, fevers. They can have some cough, wheezing. Any of those are red flags. And then you have to do a thorough exam to make sure that there's no problems. So next step is you decide, okay, this child has latent TB infection. What kind of treatment options do we have? One of the options is isoniazid and rifapentine, which is the newest of the options. Um, it's only three months of treatment, which is wonderful, but it's one big dose once a week for 12 weeks, and you need to get all 12 doses in. For kids, it's not that easy. Depending on their weight, they could be taking up to 10 tablets in one time. Okay. So I'll be honest, I give this usually to adolescents and I'll give them a choice and say, how would you like to do this? Would you like to take something once a day? For example, rifampin for four months, which you have to take every single day. Or would you rather take a bunch of medications once a week for 12 weeks? And then it's very funny. They'll be like, nope, I want to take the 12 weeks. Or they're like, nope, I want to do the four months. So then I give them a choice because both all of these are pretty much equal in effectiveness. When we do the INH and pentine, I know a lot of people are doing self-administered. We still do video DOT for these kids because it makes me nervous if they miss a whole week's worth of medication that should not be the case. So this way, we're sure that they got all 12 doses. The next one I have to say, the one I use most frequently is the four months of daily rifampin with a maximum dose of 600 milligrams. The other option is isoniazid and rifampin. The isoniazid we use 10 to 15 milligrams per AP. Um, rifampin is 15 to 20 milligrams. And then also the good old fashioned INH, <laughs> which is still on the list um, for nine months, which is difficult to take when um, because of compliance, but you just have to work with the patient and the family. For example, if a kid's not tolerating rifampin, they keep having rashes, things like that. We still sometimes go to isoniazid um, for nine months and you just, it's a little bit more work. <coughs> Excuse me. So how do we educate the parents once we, um, tell them about the treatment. So first of all, use a translator. Okay, always use a translator to make sure that you're talking to the parents in their native language and they understand everything that you're saying. First, I always review what the reason is for the treatment. Okay, um, I present it as a sort of a optimistic view in the sense that, you know, we're treating infection because the child is well now. And the reason we're treating an infection is so that later the child does not become sick. And if you become sick, then you actually have to take four drugs instead of one. I know we're for and I and H or two. And three to four months of medication is much better than taking four drugs for six to nine months. So when you present it in a simple matter of fact way that you are here, the child is well, they have infection, and we're just going to treat that. I would say 99% of parents agree, okay? Once they understand the reason for the treatment, then I go over which regimens, and as I explained already, like adolescents, I'll give a choice. Um, 
Right now, just to, I think you guys know probably that there is a severe shortage of INH, at least for the Department of Health. Um, I think we can still get it from the pharmacy. So sometimes drug shortages also play a part into which regimens we recommend. Um, for rifampin, I always ask about contact lenses because they can be stained by the reddish fluid. Um, also, rifampin should be given on an empty stomach. Sometimes it can cause a little bit of GI upset, so it's easier giving before bedtime, things like that. So it sort of depends on what works with their um, lifestyle as well. So let's say they depend, they say, okay, we'll take four months of rifampin. Then I go on to review the side effects. And of course, with rifampin, the first thing I always say is that the tears, urine, body fluids will turn orange, and that's completely fine. Because if you don't tell them that, you send them home, then they're going to be calling out in the afternoon or after the first dose all freaked out, okay? Because they won't understand why the urine is a darker orange color. I also remind them that if there is another doctor that wants to start a medicine, they have to tell them that the child is on rifampin because rifampin will interact with other medications. Teenagers, if they're on other oral contraceptive pills or something, the rifampin can decrease the effectiveness. So you have to make sure that um, they're aware of that and use some other form of birth control. Other things with rash or rifampin, sometimes rashes, liver toxicity, right? And the way I present liver toxicity with TB meds is that yes, it's a possibility. We look for it. So if the child experience any decrease in appetite, any nausea, any vomiting, you know, yellow eyes, anything, they stop the medicine right away and they call us. However, I preface it by saying liver toxicity in children is much, much rarer than in adults, especially older adults who are on multiple different medications, okay? I sometimes measure, um, mention flu-like symptoms, but in all my years of experience, I've only seen that once, and that was with intermittent dosing of rifampin. Um, and that was actually in a kid with leprosy. So INH, again, liver toxicity, again, much less frequent than in older people and adults, okay? These are healthy kids, generally not on other medicines um, with young, healthy livers. And peripheral neuropathy, I um, mentioned as well, and then rashes. So, and we also give them information. I wanted to say a word about paradoxin B6. So in adults, it's generally given. In kids, I actually rarely give it. So the only time I give B6 along with isoniazid is if a child is exclusively breastfed. So if they are getting any formula, that will be sufficient paradoxin supplementation. You don't need to give them anything more. But if they're only getting breastfed, then um, you should give it. If they're completely on vegetarian diets, not getting cheeses, you know, meats, things like that, then I'll, I tend to give it. Some kind of nutritional deficiency, if it's a symptomatic HIV-infected child, or if a pregnant adolescent, those children do need paradoxine. Otherwise, not. Our Department of Health has separate um, handouts that we give, but the CDC has these wonderful, colorful um, handouts that you can give to patients, which go through all the reasons for side effects and when they should be calling the clinic. It gives through like a little chart of when to give it, how to give it their names, and some explanation. In addition, the 3-HP, which is the isoniazid and rifapentine for three months, also has a wonderful um, chart. And you can actually, on the second page of this, I didn't copy it, it gives a chart where you actually click off um, the doses. And here's more patient information. So it's always good to give them something when they leave because when you rattle off all this in five, 10 minutes, sometimes they are looking at you with a dazed look. <laughs> and it's a lot of information to um, really accept all at the same time. So it's good if they're sent home with further information to read. And of course, all of these are available in multiple languages on CDC. Next, how do you get children to take medicine for months, months and months? 
the other thing I have to say, when I say four months and their eyebrows go up, I say, you know what? But it's much better than the nine months of ice and eyes that we, that we used to do. <laughs> so when you put it that way, then they're like, oh, four months is not as nine months. So first and foremost, you cannot give a prescription to say rifampin for four months, INH for nine months, whatever it is. We give one month worth of medication only. And then they come back to the clinic or whether it's my PEDS ID clinic or DOH clinic once a month for follow-up, okay? Then you reassess them. You can assess their compliance. They bring back the medicine, the bottle to see how much, um, how many doses are missing, how many they've taken. And you ask them to fill out charts if they need. Set phone reminders on their phones for teenagers. And even for teenagers, I always tell um, parents that they have to be the ones responsible and making sure that the teenagers are taking their medicines. Unfortunately, you can't trust teenagers with just about anything. And I have two of them. So how do we give medicine to young children? INH does come in a suspension. However, I never use it. The reason because there's a lot of sorbitol in it and it will cause the children to have a lot of diarrhea. So instead, looking at these pictures, which is actually in this nice handout um, in the right upper corner, which is available from GTBI, um, you crush the tablet in some way, shape, or form. You can either mix it in a small amount of water to dissolve it, and then you mix it into, honestly, whatever they like, whether it's applesauce, banana, yogurt, pudding, jam, ice, you know, like different things, whatever it's a spoonful of food. And then when the child gets that spoonful of food, you know that they did take the full dose. Sometimes we just put the crushed medicine directly into the food and you don't really have to mix it. So it depends on how it works better. If you're doing rifampin, you open the capsule and you take the red powder and you mix it in with the food. Um, and again, sometimes tricking the child, you give a spoonful of yogurt without the medicine, a spoonful with the medicine, and then another spoonful quickly without the medicine, okay? The other thing I tell parents is that they will learn how to take the medicine. They're not going to take it perfectly, most of them, some of them do, but most of them do not take it perfectly the first time. It takes a few days to get through it, and then they learn. But there's no choice in giving this medicine most of the time, and you just have to get through it. And in the 20 years I've been doing this, kids are wonderful, and I even had a single one that didn't learn how to take it. Some of them are more difficult than those. What if you have an infant who's not eating yet? So that you can mix the crushed tablet um, in either formula or breast milk, a small amount, and then put it in a nipple, and they'll take the dose that way. Okay. Other things that help with treatment compliance is use your TB um, resources. So if there is a uh, capacity, then DOT is a wonderful thing. With the number of cases that we have, we don't have the capacity to do directly observed therapy for LTBI. If it's um, later, if it's a contact, and um, I will put them on DOT, but <laughs> just general cases, use the school um, nurse to give medicine five days a week to the kids in school. As long as you can train them and educate them, they're a wonderful, wonderful resource. And often if the parents aren't quite on board, we'll call the pediatrician. And then with both the pediatrician and us um, working together, we'll increase the compliance. Okay, a little bit about um, window prophylaxis, okay? So this is just a chart I made up as to if you're exposed to TB, you're basically negative on your testing, negative on your chest x-ray and normal physical exam. Once you have TB infection, you have a positive test, but normal exam and normal chest x-ray. And if you have TB disease, then all of these are abnormal. Um, source case is the adult who infected the child. Um, there's a term called index case as well, who's like the first TB case that people find. Um, but I tend to use the word SIRS case. Window period is the interval between infection and the de detectable um, skin or eye test. Okay, 
So infection occurs and only your test will only be positive about eight to 10, sometimes 12 weeks later. So this is called the window period and hence from window period comes the word window prophylaxis, which means we start treating children who are at high risk for TB disease, even if every single thing is negative. So if they're just exposed, but their skin test and everything is negative, then we still do that. And this we do for children who are less than five or those who are immunocompromised. So again, usually what happens is somewhere an adult is found. They start doing a contact investigation around that adult in sort of concentric circles. And one of the things that should always be asked is, are there any children in the house and how old they are? And sometimes this does not come out on the first ask. Sometimes it comes out on multiple visits and most multiple episodes of questioning, especially if um, pair or patients are reluctant to tell you know who they're living with or they might be undocumented, things like that. Sometimes it takes multiple tries. Um, we've had times where children were denied and then our TB caseworkers went out to the house and saw multiple little toys in the hall or multiple little shoes in the hall and then said, well, who, who's, who's the owner of these toys? And it turned out that, of course, there were children living in that house or there were illegal daycares as well. So in New Brunswick and other towns, bigger towns in New Jersey, often they'll have sort of home daycares where maybe five, six children come to home, get dropped off, are there the whole time, but they're not licensed, they're not on any records, and the whole thing is done sort of illegally, and we've had multiple outbreaks in these situations as well. So this is just a sort of a diagram with the time on the x-axis. You have an active case who's found here. You start contact investigation. Normally, if you find a contact, you test them. And we'll say these are older kids and adults. And if they're negative, great. They're doing fine, no problems. Then you wait your eight to 10 weeks of window period um, and you test again. And if negative, that's great. If they're positive, you start your LTBI treatment right away and you continue it. However, if you have young children, in the house and you did a TST because they're less than two and an eye growth they're greater than two, both negative. If the two view chest X-ray was normal, if the physical exam, everything was normal, you still start treatment for LTBI and this is what's called window prophylaxis. So when do you test the children again? It's eight to 10 in little ones, I'll sometimes go to 12 weeks to be sure after the last exposure or after the source case infect infectivity period is done. So once the Department of Health determines that period, then you retest. And if the test turns out positive, then you have to reevaluate the child with a full physical exam and a chest X-ray. If the testing is negative, then we stop the treatment. But I explained to parents who are initially, and they are reluctant, understandably, to give a medicine to a completely fine, is that one, we're protecting them, right, all along. And if it turns positive, we can count this treatment into the final um, length of treatment. So we'll, that the four months will be that much shorter, or the nine months, or whatever it is. Um, the good thing is that these families often know the adult TB case, so they are aware and have a sense of what TB is, and they don't want their children to go through the same thing. So that's what makes it. So again, as I showed before, all of this badness can happen before your pet test is positive, and that's why we start treatment to make sure this doesn't happen. Okay, um, other things when I find out a child comes and is a contact. What do I want to know about the source case? First of all, how long have they been having symptoms for? How long have they been having a cough for? Are they living together? 
And just because somebody says, no, no, they don't live with me, doesn't mean that they're not really a contact. Some cousins are dropped off at people's houses and stay there the entire day, five days a week, okay? That's as good as living together. So getting a good sense of what that exposure amount is important. Looking at the source cases, imaging. Is it cavitary? Is it non-cavitary? Miliary, laryngeal, etc. cetera. Um, usually we have sputum results on the adults, which I want to know where it was done. Okay, so if it was in the hospital, I'm sorry. I, I, hospitals are notoriously not good at doing good sputums, even if they have respiratory therapists. Even at St. Peter's, at Robert, it doesn't matter where. They're just um, not as experienced as the TB clinics are. Again, was it just a non-induced one that they gave some cans to the patient? Or did they put them in the induction booth at the TB clinic and get a good um, sputum? We know that cases can be sort of varying degrees of contagiousness over time. So sometimes they're more contagious, sometimes less, and their positivity on the sputum can um, vary. Also, there's some data that sometimes the highly smear positive cases are actually so sick, they're hard for them to cough vigorously. So just because they're not coughing a lot doesn't mean that they're um, not contagious. And then when was their treatment started and how they're doing? Okay. <coughs> so the AP Red Book, which is sort of the ID Bible of um, the pediatrics, um, has evolved over the years. So regarding on what to start for window prophylaxis, before in 2012, it was less than four-year-olds and used isoniazid. Then it became less than five-year-olds and you treated with whatever, but you stopped isoniazid. So now the latest iteration, they don't talk about which regimen you start. They just say if a child is a contact and less than five years old, you should try it. You should do presumptive treatment. So the reason this is TBI is the Red Book advocates to use the terminology TB infection, because sometimes latent makes the people think that it's not quite so serious. CDC and um, most other people are still using the latent TB infection terminology. So both of them mean the same thing. Which one um, do we start? So we're not going to start INH and rifapentin with all those doses of medication in young children. Um, daily rifampin is an option daily isoniazid, especially in young infants where we know INH gets into the brain better and probably um, prevents you from getting, or in my mind, prevents you from getting TB meningitis better than rifampin. Possibly INH or rifampin, although I generally don't use that. So I've evolved over the years as well. Initially, I would use INH in all less than four-year-olds. Um, and then with time, we've actually gotten down to using isoniazid in the less than two-year-olds. Again, they're the ones who are at highest risk for TB meningitis, okay? And then if they're positive, then possibly finish with rifampin. Um, with the two to four-year-olds, I'm comfortable now starting on rifampin unless there's an issue with dosing them because you need the higher dose range for the rifampin. So if that doesn't fit with their weight, then I'll start on isoniazid. So that's just my practice. Window prophylaxis definitely works. So Dr. Stark and Dr. Cruz reviewed their data from Texas on 752 TB exposed children. Their median age was two years old and about 41% of them resided in the home of the index patient, and most of them were sphere positive. So again, it was well accepted by the families because they had an experience with what TB looks like. It was very well tolerated and safe. Only 0.9% of children had any kind of adverse events, and none of them had to stop any medications because of that. And the conversion rate for the TST was less than 5%. So Conclusion, and you can use this as evidence to the parents that it is safe and effective. Now, on to some cases. So 
This was an eight-month-old whose father came down with pan-sensitive cavitary smear-positive TB. This was in March and actually two years ago. True case, um, the pediatricians did a two-view chest x-ray, quantifieron was negative. And then about a month later, the child showed up in the ER with 104 fever and URI symptoms, meaning runny nose, congestion, cough, not acting so well, and his chest x-ray was normal right here. Then child continued to have fever and symptoms, so they were admitted um, on the 7th, and they continued to get chest x-ray because there was wheezing and all sorts of um, problems. And luckily, about a week later, they got an ID consult who actually did ask about any exposures to sick people at home and said, but this father has TB. <laughs> So at that point, they did a CT on the eight-month-old. And as you can see, these are all necrotic lymph nodes. I know you guys will be having another talk on specifically about TB disease in children. So I'm not going to go into clear details on this. But then the child was started on four drug therapy and um, had a bit of a complicated course, but ended up doing well. So lessons learned. A positive interferon gamma release assay in a less than two-year-old is believable, okay? That is a positive. However, a negative IGRA in a less than two-year-old does not rule out infection, okay? So this child at eight months had a interferon gamma release assay. Two, that child back in March, because he was eight months old and a contact should have been started on window prophylaxis. Okay, so that was not done. So this was a missed opportunity and basically preventable. Okay, this is why we, once we are in the TB community, as you guys all are now, need to educate all pediatric and adult providers. Okay, because there's just not a lot of knowledge about TB um, in general providers and let them know that this is what they do. It's easy just to order a lab test, right? And a lot of um, offices may not be doing tuberculin skin tests anymore. But then if that's the issue, they can always come to the Department of Health. Okay. Um, this one. Okay. So the, the slide is out of order, but let me. This was a true Monday morning call to our clinic back in October. A woman called us to say, I think I have TB. And our TB nurse said, um, excuse me, <laughs> what, what, why do you think that? So it turned out that mother had COVID in July and had been coughing since July. And she had had four previous rounds of tuber TB testing in other countries and in the US. And the next question, turned out there was a nine-month-old and a three-year-old at home. Oh, and when, by the way, the three-year-old had 103 fever and was wheezing. So um, in the long and short of it is, the mother turned out that week to have four plus sputum positive, cavitary TB. Her gene expert was PCR positive, and she had rifampin resistance, which is not surprising after four rounds of TB treatment. So three-year-old ended up in the <clears throat> hospital. Luckily, it turned out just to be sort of asthma symptoms. He was a known sort of asthmatic. Um, and within four days, they were evaluated by us at the TB clinic. Physical exam was normal. Both the children had negative chest x-rays for TB disease and negative um, TST in a little one and a negative IGRA in the negative um, in the older one. And it turned out that the father and maternal grandparents who were living in the house were all negative. So now back to what would you guys do? So you have a nine-month-old and a three-year-old who are exposed to MDR TB disease in the mother. Would you guys start INH since we know rifampin resistance is detected? We're assuming it's MDR. Um, start PZA and ethambutol. Start nothing because everyone else is negative in the house so far, or start nothing because you need more information on the mother. So put in your answers. Okay. 
and we'll give a little bit of time. Okay, about halfway through. Even if you're not sure, just guess, it's okay. This is a learning experience. Dr. Fay, I just shared the result. I stopped the poll. Perfect. Okay. So 84% of you would start isoniazid since the rifampin resistance is detected. So rifampin's resistance was detected on the um, gene expert. However, that's the only thing it can detect. Okay. We can't, we don't have a PCR test quickly for INH or all of the other ones. So if you detect rifampin resistance, you have to assume it's MDR, meaning that the isolate is resistant to both isoniazid and rifampin, okay? Um, good, nobody would start PZ and ambutol. Start nothing or start nothing. Okay, so what I did, I'm gonna do this. Oops, yeah. Everyone saw that, okay, still stop there. So, what we did is basically started nothing because we needed to know what kind of MDR the mother had. And it was good because it turned out that she had resistant TB, not only to isoniazid and rifampin, but also through ethambutol and actually PZA turned out to be resistant as well. Luckily, she was sensitive to fluoroquinolones and sensitive to injectables, which we're not going to give shots to these kids. So we were able to give um, levofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, to both the children's as window prophylaxis. Within three days, the older one with the history of asthma was admitted to the hospital with respiratory distress, ended up getting a dose of um, steroids in the ER, and when we tested, had already converted to positive. So this, the three-year-old, ended up having multi-drug resistant LTBI. The nine-month-old remarkably remained negative, and we were able to stop the window prophylaxis. And it turned out, because usually the infants are with the mothers a lot. So how, how was this infant not infected? Turns out that the maternal grandmother was the one who was with the infant more because the three-year-old wanted to be with mom. So that's how the nine-month-old um, stayed safe in the end. So that's just a little bit of unusual case. One other thing, looking back at ER records, this mother showed up in a pediatric ER back in September. So like three weeks before our TB clinic was called or about a month before it, and told the ER provider that I'm worried that my three-year-old has fever because one of our relatives is being evaluated for possibly TB, okay, which was her, essentially. Did the TB or did the ER tell anybody? No. So if anybody, anywhere, hears about a child who has a contact to anyone with possible TB, they should at least call the ID doctor and call the Department of Health, okay? Because we could have been three to four weeks ahead of the game with this. So in the end, it was a missed opportunity. And unfortunately, so we, need, we know TB in children is preventable. So the way they get TB is that we miss opportunities. Either we fail to find um, the adult source cases, or once they're found, they're not reported in a timely manner, or they're found, but the contact investigation doesn't reveal kids in the um, house, or they just don't get all the, inter uh, all the necessary information. Also, delaying the children who are exposed. So once we hear about these contacts, we get them into clinic ASAP. Um, because you don't know where they're in, uh, where they are along the spectrum. Um, if you don't evaluate the children completely, if you don't give them window prophylaxis, these can all lead to TB infection. And then also, if TB infection is diagnosed but not treated, of course that can lead to TB disease. And then if you don't complete your TB, um, and we have three minutes, so that's perfect. So take home points. 
I actually found this on the CDC website, which is so true. If you do not think of TB, you will never diagnose TB under any circumstances. So that's why this sort of mantra with think, test, and treat TB is, I think, very, very poignant. Um, again, you should be testing for TB if there's risk factors or symptoms. Make sure you do the appropriate testing and do the TST by the right people, okay, people who have experience. In less than five-year-olds, definitely do two-view chest x-rays. Make sure you review it with the pediatric radiologist. Get your own history, okay? And again, TB in a child is a sentinel event. So you have to look for the source case, okay? And look for more siblings and contacts. And essentially, we should be treating all LTBI in children. I always tell the parents too, they have a long life ahead of them. Do I necessarily tell them that it's only 10% chance that they'll get it in the older ones? and <clears throat> the younger ones, I say it's a high risk. Not always, because again, we need to treat these infections so they don't turn into um, disease. And then lastly, remember window prophylaxis, um, optimizing compliance. So use the Department of Health, your TB clinics, and other pediatricians and school nurses as resources. Okay, I think that's it. So I'll stop there if there are any questions and I'll stop sharing the slides. Thank you, Dr. Feha. It's great to see you. Even. Oh, hi, Patty. Hi. How are you? We do have some questions and we actually have some questions from um, a talk from last week we saved for you. Oh, okay. But I'm going to start with the, this question. Um, for a one-year-old, is T-spot recommended? And I think the recommendation is no under two. Correct. Would you, Correct. maybe more? <laughs> so the IGRAs, we basically just don't have enough data. Um, so less than one-year-olds, absolutely not. Um, and less than two-year-olds is not recommended yet. However, there are some people who say, you know what, we have some experience and it's probably okay. So the way I look at it, if I have a kid who I'm suspecting TB disease in, if the Tuberculin skin test, and let's say they're one year old. If a tuberculin skin test is negative, I'm not stopping there. I'm going to do every test there is, including IGRAS, because if you do come up with a positive test in a less than two year old on a T spot or a quantifiron, you're going to believe that test. It's just that a negative test does not rule out infection. Does that make sense, hopefully? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And I know um, on August 18th, we are going to have another talk about treatment with TB, but there is a question that I guess maybe we can um, talk about now and we can also review it in the 18th. But if you have an active case, a child, um, and they're excluded from school until therapy is complete, or when will it be safe to return to school? Okay. Um, so this is a child with active TB. Yeah. Okay. So in general, Children less than 10 with active TB are very, very rarely infectious. Their force of cough is not strong enough to spew the TB bacteria all over. Um, often they have only hyalur adenopathy and no lung disease, so no parenchymal lung disease. Um, so they're really not infectious. Do I put these kids in isolation when they're in the hospital? Yes. Is it because they absolutely need to be? No, it's because I just can't stand all the questions from everybody 500 times a day as to why this child is not in isolation. But um, if a child has been, let's say just has hyalur adenopathy and has no symptoms and there's nothing else going on, I, I'll clear them to have them go back to school. If there is any question then you can keep them out of school for a couple weeks. And after they've been on treatment for a couple weeks, then they can generally go back to school. But again, teenagers are different. Teenagers are more like adults and they can be positive for a while. So if they have sputums, then you should follow them and do the adult protocol where you need three negative sputums in order to go um, come off isolation. But the vast majority of children are not. And I know some schools even exclude if they just have LTBI, which is should never be the case. If they just have LTBI, they should be going to school. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I agree. Um, 
uh, let's see, this was, this was, um, I think, well, I think you covered this, um, but the question was, um, does the recommendation of LTB re regimens change for pediatric cases? And I don't think when you went through it, you know, the first recommendations were for pentine and then the shorter course therapy. So um, I don't know if they have anything you wanted to add to that, but I think that was covered. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's another question and whoever asked that question, if you have, you know, additional questions to that, or if it wasn't covered, please feel free to put it in the chat. But this came up uh, during one of our adult talks, I think, for LTBI, and it was, um, what's a better assessment and medical management for a pediatric close contact who was previously treated with LTBI and exposed again by another TB case? <laughs> Good, excellent question. Um, and we actually had that happen. Um, so if it's a young child, um, for example, for example, we had a father um, first round, everybody, mother and um, brother stayed negative, but the little one was positive, the three-year-old, actually two-year-old at the time. Um, so we gave a course of LTBI treatment. Then father turned positive again. And when we reevaluated, the mother and the brother actually turned positive. So in that case, I at least do a repeat evaluation of the young child. For example, that child was then three years old. So I would do a full exam, full um, chest x-ray again. And then probably, depending on the case, um, maybe restart therapy. Um, until we know that that child is really not at risk. Or for example, this child that we had was TST positive a year before, but then was quantifuron negative at um, three years of age. So it brought up this whole dilemma as to whether the TST was false positive the first time around. Um, but long and short of it is, you should reevaluate that child again um, to see if there's any evidence of TB disease and in young children, I'm always conservative. So if there's any question, just restart your window prophylaxis, okay? So this is the reason that TB is fun because it's never ever boring because of <laughs> cases and questions like this. Yes, absolutely. And um, just as a sidebar, if anybody has any other questions, please put them in the chat. But um, just wanted to go back to when you were talking about the child that's on Leviquin, that it is available in liquid. <laughs> yes, thankfully. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so of note, we're I'm seeing more MDR LTBI this year than I have, I think, ever before. So we definitely, our MDR um, TB cases are going up and hence our contacts are going to go up. Um, levofloxacin is very difficult to get for kids less than 10 um, on the outside because, or even sometimes older, the insurance companies just say, oh, nope, fluoroquinolones in kids, absolutely not. You need a pre-authorization. And then even with the pre-authorization, sometimes they don't give it. So it's a quite a um, tenuous process. So it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you for getting the um, levofloxacin at the Department of Health because then we can start these contacts on treatment sooner. And, keep and the other medications, if they don't come liquid and you have little ones, you'd have to find a compound pharmacy. Mm -hmm. um, is the pediatric age limit to use fluoroquinolones for LTBI treatment in children? I think, uh, is there a pediatric no. age limit? No. So the bottom line is no. If that if you have an MDR contact and levofloxacin is the best drug and the only drug you can give, I would give it to a two-week-old. It doesn't matter. You need to make sure and do everything possible to keep that young child from getting TB disease because then it's going to be much more difficult to treat. Yes, we don't like to use fluoroquinolones in kids um, or anybody for that matter because it has a bunch of side effects. Um, everybody worries about like cartilage issues. The cartilage issues were found in beagle puppies, not in human children. So um, I've used fluoroquinolones for many, you know, reasons and many young children, and they tend to do very well with that. But use it with good reason, just not haphazardly. There's one more. Wait. Actually, there's one before that one. If you have a child two years old, positive HIV, negative IGRA, 
chest x-ray in Nigeria in September 22 was abnormal with no hyalur involvement. Classified B1, child adopted and entered U.S. in May of 2023, ID physician following child, IGRA in May 2023 negative, no follow-up chest x-ray perform per ID physician recommendations, no treatment. What would you suggest for this child? Now, they, they're HIV positive. Yeah, I would definitely get a chest x-ray. Um, so, you know, again, um, what was done in another country is sometimes difficult to decipher. So I would want to do a chest x-ray here, a two-view chest x-ray, and review that chest x-ray myself. Because again, in an HIV child, who may or may not be on medicines. Um, if they're not on medicines, then they're definitely immunocompromised. Uh, negative IGRA is not going to um, be enough to say that that's not TB. So I would definitely do further evaluation on that child. And I do see, okay, so um, not sure if I understand. Uh, the index case is MDR. What LTBI treatment will you use for window prophylaxis for the LTBI treatment in kids and adolescents? Okay, so most often recommendations is use levofloxacin. However, I generally wait um, to start even window because I want to make sure that that isolate is sensitive to levofloxacin because if it's not um, or just partially, then you know, you're giving a medicine um, for nothing. So in young kids, I just saw <laughs> 10 minutes ago, a three-year-old who's um, a contact to an MDR case, um, that contact luckily sounds like they're smear negative and hasn't been coughing and had more pulmonary nodules. So that kid's going to be a little bit less risk. But what I do is I keep testing them and keep following them closely. Um, to make sure that there's nothing developing. And then once the um, drug resistance testing is back on the case, then we start, if levofloxacin worked, we start levofloxacin right away. Um, if it's, yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Would I start levo if it was a very, very high risk case? Possibly. Yeah. So each of these cases are sort of based on case by case. That's so true. They really are. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but I just think that this, you know, thank you. It was a great presentation. And I know we get very crazy when we see little kids that are exposed to contacts to TB cases. And we just can't stress how important it is that these children get in because it can, you know, especially under four, it can progress to primary disease. And at one point here in New Jersey, over a period of about two years, we had seven cases of TB meningitis from missed adults being misdiagnosed and the child ultimately being misdiagnosed. And um, you know, my experience with that and seeing some of the outcomes with permanent neurological um, deficits, it was heartbreaking. So um, we're super, uh, I at least like to get that message out that how important it is to get these kids evaluated. So as soon as you see these young children, um, make that your TB priority of the day, please. Um. Yeah. And also that works on parents as well, I have to say. So if they're like, oh, but you know, the child's fine. I said, yes, but if they do get disease, it could be TB meningitis, which means they'll end up neurologically devastated or dead. And if, you know, I, I sort of use that as a last <laughs> resort, but <laughs> if nothing else works, I, that's what I say. And that usually convinces them. So <laughs> to go there, you have to go there. Yes. Um, let me see. And I just, I, this is that pocket card that is available through GTBI. Um, and I'm just going to scroll down there. If you go to the GTBI website, and if you haven't, please go because they have such great products. Um, and then the other one that this was all in the chat, but in case you missed it, let's see, we got our, um, this is the uh, patient, uh, pediatric assessment tool, which um, if you didn't know it's out there, please download it, get a PDF. If you could get it out to your pediatricians, that is wonderful because this is a risk assessment tool that we developed for pediatricians. So when these kids are coming in, they're thinking TB and then they're thinking about testing for TB and they're not testing the wrong people, they're testing the right people. Exactly. 
Oh, let me see, just make sure we have no more questions. I see a few more things in the chat. Oh, these are some more links in the chat that um, Shrek to put in. And I don't believe I see any other questions right now, but um, wait. <laughs> if anyone has any more questions later, they can email them, I guess. Absolutely. And then we can answer later. Yeah, so, um, you know, we start the beginning of the next session. We always ask if you have any questions, if you have any for Dr. Feha, we will definitely make sure she gets to them. Thank you, Dr. Feha. As always, we love your presentations. <laughs> and My pleasure. It's Friday, everybody. So with that being said, next week, like I said, we're going to do um, diagnosis of TB disease with Dr. Wang. And it's the same time next week at uh, Friday at 10 o'clock. So everybody have a great Friday and we will see you next week. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you for your Thanks, Patty. All Don't right. forget to do your evaluations, please. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Have a good weekend. You too.